Hello and welcome to Faith Talks. In today's program, we'll be discussing faith and global responsibility. Joining me in the studio and ready to share their views and comments are Fabrice Baker Livingston, the Communication Officer for ADRA here in the UK, and James Shepley, a pastor in the UK here as well. So welcome. Thank you. Thanks. So tell me a little bit about global responsibility. Should we as Christians care for things that are outside of our own little world? James, what do you think? Absolutely, Kirsten. We certainly should. I think about Jesus. He cared for everybody, no matter who they were, and uh, we should do the same. When we are talking about having a global responsibility, it kind of rests with us that it goes beyond our even our little community go even further to a larger scale. And we're thinking of aid organizations. We're thinking of poverty in developing countries. What are some of the things that your organization is involved in, Fabrice? Um, the ways in which ADRA work are really quite vast and varied. So we have a development side and a relief side. So obviously we are there when there are... Um, uh, emergencies and we are there literally on the ground because we have such a wide and vast network of other ADRA offices around the world so that's one way in which we work and we also have a few programs currently at the moment so we work with very small communities often that people perhaps might not think of we have a project at the moment in Zimbabwe working with women in four very rural areas so women who can't ordinarily get to a doctor surgery or a hospital they don't have the funds it's not available it's not in their community so we're working with them um, and we've also just um, signed on two new projects for next year, which um, we will talk about later. And you went to Zimbabwe recently. Yes. How did you experience that as a person? Was that your first trip? It was my first trip abroad uh, with Adra. It was also my first trip to Africa and it was fantastic. It was wonderful. Zimbabwe is a beautiful country and um, re really rich in uh, vibrancy. People are very nice there. The country is beautiful to look at. Um, and also as well, the people were wonderful. And not just those who we met who were working for Adra Zimbabwe, but those who we met who were our beneficiaries, the women that we spoke to, the doctors, the nurses, the midwives, those who were also um, sacrificing their own time to work alongside with us. They were very, very nice. It was very um, sobering at times. It was bittersweet because it really allows you to see how far your money, how far your sacrifice and how far your time actually goes when, it, when you see the work happening in another country. So it, it was wonderful. And James, you also have a background in developing work and many would actually say that money is just being wasted um, when we're giving money to charities who say they're going to do things overseas. You went and lived overseas. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we had the privilege of being overseas twice. Uh, so we were over in Madagascar for two years, um, that massive island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, which is, uh, it looks small on the map, but it's bigger than France. Uh, and we were in West Africa for four years in Burkina Faso, which m most people in the UK have never heard of. Um, but it's just um, b besides Ghana. So it's a landlocked country in West Africa. Uh, and I have to say that it was a really, really enriching period, both of them, for us. Uh, and it's fascinating culturally. You meet some amazing people. But you also recognize that, that many people's lives are very, very difficult. Uh, in those places. I'm not necessarily talking about uh, the, the ordinary life, but people uh, who are at the margins of society sometimes have it much more difficult than they would even over here. And that's something you talked about, people on the margins as well. But how can I in the UK make a difference um, with people in the margins? I'm not going to go and live in Burkina Faso or Zimbabwe. Why should I even be bothered? Do you mean uh, to help people over there? Yes, to help people, but why should I give my money? Why should they be my concern if they're living so far away? Well, I think that it's our common humanity. Um, I think uh, both Fabrice and I, we had the opportunity to go over there. Mm. And I think it's a, a really very stark when you arrive over there and you realise the difference in terms of... Um, just living standards generally. I remember somebody asked me from Burkina Faso at one, one time, and it was a local guy, he said, is it true uh, that people in Paris have um, running water in their, coming from their taps in the apartment and they st still go out and buy bottled water? And, you know, I, mm -hmm. he asked me this question as though it was something that um, 
uh, th th these people were driving Lamborghinis or, or something like that. It was just uh, uh, inconceivable, inconceivable that somebody who actually had water coming in uh, into their house would go out and spend money on, on bottled water. So the differences in realities are huge. And I think that's, you know, we take a lot of things for granted, as you're pointing out, that people in other countries don't take for granted. I think my questions were more, there is also a bit of complacency, I think, in, in the developed world to feel, well, you know, we've got it good enough and, and they are at fault themselves in these countries that are not as prosperous as us. How do we deal with questions like that? Is that something you come across, uh, Fabrice, that people feel there is no need for me to give or get involved in a charity like ADRA? Sure, we do um, oftentimes come across people who perhaps um, don't have, I guess what I would call a charity mindset. They don't understand why they have to help other people. They don't really um, believe perhaps that helping other people is important. Um, and I think it kind of goes back a little bit to what James says. It's when you go out there and see these people and you don't have to travel, you just need to turn on the television or perhaps have a look at the wider media. The, the internet is, shows a numerous amounts of stories and clips and videos that you can just see people living in such different um, communities to us. Uh, when I was in Zimbabwe, I remember talking to a lady who was the same age as me and I thought she was like 15 and she was on her fourth child and her husband had two more wives. And I just thought, wow, our, our lives are so different. How can I talk to you and not even offer to help? And it doesn't always mean I have to give you money because we can take someone's time or we can take your your strategic thinking or something. So there's, there's always different ways to help. I think perhaps people might get locked into the... The, the the mind frame that it always has to be money and that's not that's not correct especially not for Adra we have a, a huge volunteering program that we're trying to um, we're trying to get more and more volunteers onto our database and that just requires your time and that can be from something as you know going to a church to talk about charity and aid and relief and poverty to you know traveling abroad with us it, it's it's quite a large spectrum of things people can do I'm quite interested in hearing a little bit more about that Fabrice because in I would always think that you know, it's all about money. Mm. It's about you wanting my money, you know, mm. standing down on the high street or knocking on my door um, or having these large charity appeals on TV. It's always sure. about money and using very emotional photos and, and imagery to get money from mm. you. But, but tell me more about it's more than my money you're wanting. I think for myself, for Adra, we're, we're, and, and I can talk on behalf of myself, the communications department and um, the volunteering department, we're really concerned with changing people's behaviour. So we want people to really understand that, you know, Adra is a charity that they can really relate to. It can even be their charity of choice if they want it to. I mean, I have a 17-year-old sister. She's not in a position to really support us with a financial commitment every month, but she certainly is very excited and she can certainly hold a, a programme or put together some, a promotional pack she can dedicate her time and her resources um, and I think that's that's what's important this afternoon we received some gift boxes from some children at a nearby school and those children can't give us any money but they they're so excited to give something they just want to share something with other children around the world and I think that's what's important we always try to recognize that not everybody can give us money so we are trying to just um, communicate that there are many different ways to really help us um, and so yeah we, we're looking for volunteers at, at all opportunities. And James, you know, you talked about your two living opportunities or when you live twice, actually, in, in, in two different countries. What were some of the things that you came back with? Um, what were some of the life-defining moments for you when, you when you're looking at global responsibility? I, I think they're all in little, little stories, episodes that you live through, which are particularly powerful. Uh, because you don't need to do huge things to change people's lives in these countries. Uh, there was one particular time uh, we were driving along the road. There was a lady who was um, literally being dragged by a, a cord by her five-year-old son along the roadside, and um, because she uh, she had 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 polio, and so she was in the dust, being just led by her five-year-old child. And we were able to just pull up the car stop, try and talk to her. She didn't speak the, the, our language, but we found out that she was Nigerian. She'd come in into this, this area. And at, at the, the organization I was working for, ADRA at the time, um, had a program of um, uh, handi handicapped cycles, cycles for handicapped people. So we were able to put her in the car, take her home, 
uh, find out where she lived, and that afternoon we could deliver to her uh, a, a hand-pedaled bicycle. In a, an afternoon, you could change somebody's mobility, just like that. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, which is amazing, and it was, a, it was something that only cost maybe a hundred pounds. Mm. But what does it do to you as a person when you go out and you are able to actually give that help to somebody? Well, it gives you incredible joy, incredible satisfaction, uh, a real sense of, me of having found the meaning of life in some ways. Yeah. And yet you chose to come back to the UK. You are now working as a local minister in... in in, can you call it the West Countries? Or? Yeah, yes, you can. Yes, yeah, it yeah. is in the West in Countries. Gloucestershire, absolutely. Uh, in yeah. Gloucestershire. Um, how are you taking your experiences from Burkina Faso and Madagascar with you into your current work? Well, they're really different places. Um, but it's not to say that there aren't difficulties uh, um, in Cheltenham, even. Cheltenham is, is perceived uh, and very largely a, a, a posh Regency town you know, in the Cotswolds. Um, but there are still difficulties there. There are people who need, um, who go to food banks. Um, there are people who, who are in financial difficulties. They might need debt counselling. There are all sorts of things that churches can get in, involved in to try and help the local community. And how have your local churches decided to get involved in your community? Are they re aware of being responsible on a larger scale or are they happy just to be... Uh, well, absolutely. Um, for instance, uh, this Saturday in Cheltenham, they held a harvest festival, and for harvest festival, they brought uh, everybody brought um, donations. And so, yesterday, one of the church members and I, that we went off to County Community Project, which is a local uh, a local project in Cheltenham, to deliver that food, which then goes into food parcels or to, to a food bank. So there are all sorts of things that churches can get involved in and do get involved in to try and make a difference in people's lives locally. Mm. And I'm going to challenge a little bit on that, James, because yeah. here you have seen extreme poverty yeah. and challenges in, in, in Burkina Faso and I take it in Madagascar as well. Yeah. And you come to a more affluent part of the West and you're talking about food banks, you're talking about doing stuff locally, Surely the suffering proportionate is, is less here than there. Should you not just be concerned with sending money there or why are you even concerned locally? I think we have to be, uh, to, to act where we are. Um, that's key. But they, just because there are problems uh, next door doesn't mean we shouldn't be alive to the problems on the other side of the world which are greater, no doubt. I mean, Ebola is the obvious example right now. Uh, and, you know, it's amazing what people are doing. And Ad Adra is also supporting in that mm. area too. Yeah. And that comes back to you, Fabrice, as well, because uh, when people are talking about charities and, and, and raising funds for, for relief and, and for development work in the third world, many times people are also saying, well, we have so much need here. So is your organization only concerned with relieving problems in a developing world or are there anything in this country that you're also involved in? Because that tends to be a critique. Mm, yeah. Sure. A lot of times people say charity begins at home and that's often one of the questions people always ask, why aren't we doing something within the UK? It's funny you should say that we are a development and relief agency so primarily we are concerned with working abroad in um, certain parts of the country but we do have a few smaller projects based in the UK. We do support um, a, a special needs association and we actually have just um, supported a, a hospice for children on the, on the Isle of Wight. So we do have projects Projects. Um, I guess for us, the, the conundrum is how do we promote such projects and also still ask for funds from people um, for the projects in the developing world. So I think it's more of a balance and act for ADRA rather than a either or. So we do both. Um, but obviously, uh, I think as James is kind of alluding to, there's, there's problems abroad and there's problems at home. And I think it's about understanding that um, helping your neighbour or caring for your neighbour can be the person physically next to you. Or actually, it could be your global neighbour. It could be somebody um, on the other side of the world that you're aware of that you know you can help. But why did you choose to go and work for an aid organisation? Because you probably could have chosen many different, mm -hmm. uh, more financially rewarding jobs with your expertise. Yeah. I mean, why do you want to, at such a young age, go into working for a charity? 
It's funny you should say that, actually. The way I am, um, when I was at university, I always knew I wanted to study marketing. And um, I did that in my, for my first degree. And there was a module on charity marketing led by this lady. And she was fantastic. She just really made me think about what, you don't just market um, products or fast moving consumer goods. You market things to other people. You can affect social behavior. You can affect how people really want to think and how they perceive things and how they understand human nature. And I really was interested in that. And then I left, you university and I just wanted to go and get a good job with you know a good job means with lots of money and I just after a while you realize waking up every day and doing something you don't really like isn't worthwhile life is important and oftentimes life is short and sometimes even snatched away from you so I realized I think last year I wanted to wake up and do something that I was really proud of and I when I um was applying for the role here at ADRA, I even said, which is a little bit cheesy, I said, I wanted to change my small corner of the world. I wanted to know that I was doing something to proactively help people. And I didn't feel like I was doing that in my previous roles. And they weren't bad roles. They were, you know, they were fine. And they were almost public sector roles. But I wanted to literally know that if I didn't go to work, then there would be somebody that I wasn't able to help. So I really wanted to, to make it a lot more granular for myself. And do you feel, I mean, I know you've been in the job for about a year. Yeah. Do you feel that it is meeting your expectations on that front? A hundred percent. It's 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 a really vast role. It, it's um it it really is it can go as as big as anything, I guess, to be honest. Um it's it's fantastic. I guess it has its challenges, its challenges at the same time with with everything else. But I certainly wake up and I'm really excited to come to work, excited to know what I can do to really help a campaign or to push something forward, how I can communicate to people better. So, no, I'm really happy in the role and I'm really happy that I decided to leave my job and focus on something that perhaps isn't always a popular choice. James, um Something in your trips or something in your life must have triggered you from working in development to going into being a minister. Um, and I'm not asking you necessarily to share your whole personal <laughs> story on that. Um, but faith must have had a role somewhere in your life there. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, in, indeed. I mean, uh, it's maybe uh, too much to go into right now, Kirsten, as you say. But there are moments, I think, when you know that... Um, you know, you come to certain crossroads in your life and it's clearer uh, which path God wants you to, to take. And uh, that was the case which has led me down to, to becoming a minister. But would you then also, as a minister, you, you know, I know you went and studied, would you also say that faith plays a role in how we actually respond to the global crisis, how we actually respond to the humanity that we share this world with? Yeah, faith is uh, absolutely key. I think that if you think about um, people who are going um, overseas or even people who are making time uh, to go and visit the person next door, often it's something that is, is uh, compassion or something which is triggered uh, towards that person or, or that community that they're serving. And compassion is really uh, at the very heart of, of, of God's um, attitude towards us. And we did, a, we did a program recently on compassion and talking about how it's not about being pitying somebody else, but it's about journeying with somebody else mm. right. and, and walking with the, in the pain and suffering in many ways. That's mm. something we did a whole different program on, so I don't want to talk too much about okay. compassion. But, but when you are bringing your experience from working in the third world with your family into into your current job, has that played an impact in, in what type of projects your church gets involved in, do you think? I wouldn't say, uh, not yet. Um, although, actually, ha that having been said, um, we did do uh, a sponsored cycle ride over in the Cotswolds recently, which was raising money for ADRA. Mm. Uh, and we're still involved in, in supporting um, a, an excluded women project in Burkina Faso and some church members have supported on that. So yes, I suppose it, it does continue. So it does continue. It's not yeah. something you can just turn off and say, okay, it. I'm coming home. I don't care more about the people. Um, but do you not get tired of seeing suffering when you're living surrounded by suffering in another country? Yeah, you do get tired. And what do you do with that? I mean, do you not say, God, why... Why is there so much? Why is there so much imbalance in, in this world? Or what do you do with that? 
I think it's really tricky. I think it's it's really tricky to deal with because there is a huge imbalance, mm. uh, and anyone who's tra travelled to um, some of these countries can see it. There are imbalances there in 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 those countries themselves, but on a global scale, there's huge imbalances. Uh, and I guess you try and do the little bit that you can do. You know, um, yeah. So, are you saying also then, as Christians, that we have a greater responsibility of care? I would most certainly say that. I think it's important. I think we're human. I think it's almost a human need to help someone else. If that's, I mean, it can be as simple as helping someone to cross the road, someone drop something. Um, and then when you're aware of a, of a global crisis or of a global um, campaign to help, I think if you can, whatever it is that you can do to help, you should do to help. If it means you pack um, hygiene kits in your local community centre and then you ship it off, that's what you do. If you can donate five pounds a month, that's what you do. If you can rally the troops and campaign, that's what you I think it's it's a basic human need to help other people. And as a Christian, I, I really believe it's what God expects of us. And to be honest, I think that's even often an opportunity to say, I want to help other people because I believe it's what God wants me to do. And it's often like an evangelistic way of showing people how you want to live your life. So you're saying it becomes an outward manifestation in totally. many ways. Totally, yeah, totally, yeah. At the moment I'm studying and a lot of people on my course say, you know, what? what's your organisation, who do you work for, why do you work for them? And for me, the, the obvious answer is, oh, I'm a Christian, I wanted to work for a charity. It gives me a real sense of um, I'm doing something small to help somebody around the world and that's something that I want to wake up and be happy to do every day. And has it impacted your faith in any way? 100%, absolutely. I was, from working at Adra, from travelling to Zimbabwe, I remember one evening we um, went to Gokwe North, a very rural area, um, and I ne I had never really been to such places before, and I was really scared and very nervous and underneath a mosquito net. And, you know, you have to understand, people don't even have mosquito nets, so I was privileged, but I was nervous in this place, and I prayed and said to God, please, I just want to make it through the night. I don't know what could happen. I could hear mosquitoes and snakes, and I was so scared. <laughs> so that's a, a small funny thing but it most certainly I was just just struck with wow I, I could have been born anywhere I could have been born in any country and I wasn't I was born in the developed world to parents I was able to have a good education I'm so thankful so blessed and I think that's for me it just a, it's a little bit of reality check. James some people will criticize and say that faith organizations shouldn't get involved in global development or relief because they're actually just paying people to become Christians. Is that your experience? No, uh, it isn't. Um, I think that, well, the organization I was working for, ADRA, had a totally different approach. Um, it was to help anybody, whoever they were, uh, and to always to try and look for the least, uh, as Jesus would have said, the least of uh, these brothers of mine. You know, and whether it's widows or orphans or, or um, excluded women in Burkina Faso or whoever, um, to look for those people and try and support them. No strings attached. But as a Christian organization, wouldn't you primarily go out and then try to help other Christians? Well, in many countries, you know, there aren't that many Christians. Um, so Burkina Faso is a majority Muslim country. Yeah, we were working up in the north of the country. I'm not even sure. I think there was one employee working for us who was not who was Christian. So, <laughs> no, <laughs> you're helping the people that you meet uh, with the needs that you meet there. What are some of the main key things that you think that we here in England can actually do to help should we just give money? We talked earlier about there's other mm -hmm. things than money. Um, what would help to actually solve the problem of the global imbalance in resources and in suffering? What can we do? What can I do in my little corner? Well, I think finance is, um, is really key. I, there are organizations which are campaigning organizations as well that maybe you can, you can look at and support those to look at ways that the government can do things differently, uh, to uh, campaign uh, in, in favor of global, global, uh, the elimination of global poverty, for instance, these sorts of things. So to get involved in those sorts of things is a good idea. Yeah. Is there anything that you feel that you would like to tell your younger self before you went and lived in these countries? Do it again. <laughs> really? Yes. Would you take your family out to live in such in, in places that 
compared to the luxury we have in the West, even though we're not all driving Lamborghinis or whatever it is that people think we drive here in the West, would you take your family out with young children to a place that is more deprived? Well, we did. Um, but we did it first when, when I went with my wife. Uh, we went as a young married couple. We didn't have any kids. Uh, and then while we were out there, we had our first daughter. Uh, and um, of course, I think that if we hadn't lived there first and we hadn't got to know the situation, we might have had our doubts and reservations. But then having been there, we were in, in Madagascar at the time, and seeing what the principal threats are, which are traffic and malaria, well, those are things, well, at least the traffic, uh, which is a risk wherever you are. Mm. And when you know that um, you can, where the, the nearest chemist is and you've got the phone numbers of a few people who will, will, can help you out, that really puts things in perspective and you realise that you can handle this. And I plan lots of other people do and can as well. So, yeah. But here you have your own baby daughter and you're seeing other children suffering. How did you feel as a father? Did you feel guilty? <clears throat> uh, no, uh, I didn't feel guilty. Um, I think you, you're, you, uh, you're joyful with um, the people who have other kids who are doing well and, and when their kids are sick then you're, you're suffering with them in the same way that they would with your child. Because I think often we have in the West, when we get involved really with charity work, we can feel a little bit guilty that we have so much. You don't, didn't feel that at all? Do you feel that when you went to Zimbabwe? Uh, I did have a sense of guilt. Small things um, like I wasn't used to not having Wi-Fi. I wasn't used to not mm. always having my mobile phone around. But actually, I think the guilt kind of disappeared and I, it was replaced with this a sense of realism. There is life without a phone. There is, oh, there was life without phones and Wi-Fi and all the modern gadgets that you get used to. Um, and I think actually, I can imagine that once you live there, you just realize there's more important things and actually you just journey with people. Um, it's not about guilt, it's about what can I do to help you? What can you do to help me? Um, it might not be the same balance of power, but it's, it's certainly a journey with people. I think here at the closure of the programme, we can just come back to some of the things we started with where you were talking about that not everybody has a spirit of charity. How can we perhaps help educate people to feel more of a responsibility or, or take responsibility of what we have and try to balance it on a global scale, one person at a time? I think if people have the opportunity to, to, to go and see that can make a difference mm. and really make a, a, a huge difference. Certainly opened my eyes <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> I do it again. Mm. Definitely. I think it's about understanding what you, everybody can make a difference. It's just about what it is that they can do. Um, from the smallest child to the oldest person, everybody can do something. And it's just about realizing um, how they can do it. I want to say thank you to both of you for coming in the studio today and talking about your work with uh, the organization ADRA and Global Responsibility. So thank you to both of you. And why not add your voice to the debate by joining us on our Facebook page at Faith Talks. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next time.